Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. So my child is now old enough that she likes going to the mall. And this is key. She's still young enough that she likes going to the mall with me. And as you'll hear in this episode, I live close to the mall that I went to when I was a teen. And so I can make a direct comparison, and you'll hear that. But it's also interesting to see the mall through her eyes. Yeah, there's no music store like her dad had, but so what to her? There's no reason to buy music in a store. She goes to the mall to see people, to eat and drink things, and yeah, maybe get a toy or buy clothes for school. But mostly, at least for now, she likes to go to the mall because it's a place for us to go together, to hang out, just us, with something to do theoretically, but not literally. And that is the power of these kind of public spaces. And so I wanted to share this episode again, so we can think about what we lose when they're gone. For reasons that'll become clear in a moment, I took a couple of hours this week and went and hung out at the mall where I used to hang out in high school. If you have been to a mall regularly over the past few years, you don't need me to tell you that they've changed. This mall wasn't dead or even close to dying the way so, so many malls are right now. Research suggests that malls are closing rapidly across North America, being turned into condo complexes and, mostly, Amazon warehouses. Now, my old mall is not yet either of those things, but what it is, is half empty. And what is notable is what has vanished. The stores where we used to kill time and just browse. The music store, long gone. The electronics store has vanished. So has the sports apparel shop, where we used to gather and swap baseball cards and just hang out and argue over whose team was better. What remains in this mall are stores that you go to with a list. A big grocery store, a Walmart, a Home Depot. And in between those three staples are some smaller shops, a big gym, and a lot of empty storefronts. We all understand why this has happened, I am sure. Online shopping was killing malls even before the pandemic made everyone who wasn't into a Prime member. But what I'm not sure we understand is what we lose when we no longer have an excuse to browse, to find something unexpectedly that delights us, or even to just wander aimlessly, just looking. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Jason Gurriel is the author of several books, including Forgotten Work, and his most recent, which we're discussing today, On Browsing, which is now available online and in bookstores everywhere and at your favorite mall, right? I hope, Jason? Well, I hope so, but the bookstores have fled the malls, so... Maybe the, indep- maybe the independent bookstores. We're here to talk about malls, but also just browsing and uh, a whole lot of things that we maybe used to take for granted uh, or maybe used to even not like so much and now we miss. So Jason, why don't you start just by describing that mall that you basically grew up in? Was it a unique mall or just like a suburban mall mall? Well, I grew up in a in Etobicoke, so sort of a, kind of a suburb of Toronto. I grew up near a few malls that we, my family and I frequented, uh, Cloverdale, Sherway Gardens, Square One. When I was a kid, the, these malls were, they were relatively modest affairs. They were, they were uh, and affordable. Like they, they sort of were human scale to some extent. There was usually a couple of department stores that sort of anchored the mall. And, you know, you would have a Cloverdale, which was, which you could walk to and from where I lived. And it's still around, although, Slated for condos, uh, I'm, I'm given to understand. But Cloverdale had, you know, a bookstore, had like a WH Smith, which later became a Coles. It had a music store, a grocery store. So it sort of met it met it met our needs. It was, uh, you know, sort of beloved by us. 
The other ones I mentioned, Sherway and, and Square One, they were bigger malls. But still, you know, at, at that time in the 80s, relatively affordable. They've, they've since, those, those in particular have really kind of metastasized in, in recent years. They've, they've become very, very upscale. They've lost all their physical media stores, more or less. I mean, I think, you, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have an Indigo, but Indigo, my, my feeling is more or less almost like a lifestyle store at this point. Um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have the selection of books that like, a, you know, the world's biggest bookstore had uh, once upon a time in, in downtown Toronto. So, so the malls have really changed since I was a kid. And I would say they've become less useful. And, you know, certainly some of the malls, like the bigger ones, have no longer meet, meet the needs of, of, uh, of fam- the kind of family that I grew up in. So this is going to sound dumb, but uh, you wrote a whole book on it. So I'm going to get you to define browsing in that mall maybe that you grew up in. Well, it was it was a ritual. Um, I had a, an extremely boring childhood. You know, my parents, had, I had a modest upbringing. My parents didn't, you know, relatively working class. We didn't travel a lot. We didn't, uh, I wasn't in, you know, extracurricular. When Saturday came around, uh, we went to the mall. And it had to be Saturday because when I was young, that was the era before Sunday shopping, right? Sunday was like, I mean, it truly was that that day of rest. Like you couldn't really do anything. So, you know, browsing was, you know, a ritual on Saturdays. We would go to the mall as a family. We would inevitably park outside a department store. I don't know why, but for some reason, that was what we had to do. We didn't go into the mall proper. Go through Sears. We go to the food court, and it was a treat. It was actually a treat because my mom was, you know, she was like sort of a committed cook. She made all of the meals, and so it was. It was sort of like a novelty to like go to Burger King <laughs> on Saturday, and we we would split up, and it was sort of a lovely experience. I would have a little bit of spending money. Sometimes I would be after a particular book or a cassette, or a, after that a CD. You know, if we went to a bigger mall like Square One, there, where, which had a comic store, I might be interested in in a comic. Sometimes I I wasn't after anything in particular, but I had a little bit of money and I wanted to browse and I wanted to to buy something. It was it was lovely and it was uh, it was what it was what we did every every Saturday and uh, there was a kind of uh, freedom to that and also sort of. Um, you know, as a young kid, having a little bit of independence, being on my own for an hour, <laughs> you know, perusing the the Stephen King novels that my mom would have frowned upon and which I never brought home, felt felt it felt uh, like an, a kind of an adult activity. Sure, you've written an entire collection of essays on browsing. You clearly think that that we're missing something by no longer doing it. What are we missing? Well, um. I didn't necessarily think we collectively were missing it. I I wrote the original essay that formed sort of the heart of this, the, the sort of opening chapter of this book uh, about a year into the pandemic. It was early 2021. And I was feeling very, feeling very frustrated. I felt, you know, we were, we'd been, you know, at home for a year, we were very much marooned, consigned to our screens, constantly scrolling. And I was sort of missing bricks and mortar browsing, missing being in record stores, bookstores, movie stores, which which had been dwindling anyways prior to the pandemic. And I, I wrote this piece that, as I say, formed sort of the, the bulk of the first chapter and I, I, I assumed immediately it was going to be like a. I, I, I just assumed it was too curmudgeonly and too nostalgic and and even maybe reactionary. Like I thought, oh, this is just who's going to be interested in this? I sent it to an editor I, I know at the Walrus, not thinking he would actually want to take it. He just happens to be someone who reads uh, who reads a lot of my writing, and and I was surprised that that he wanted to take it for the for the magazine, and then when it came out. You know, I I always get it wrong. Like I've written things that I thought were relatively benign, and then that provoked like a really hostile reaction online. You know, like a negative book review or something. With something I thought it was like a mixed book review, and it wasn't a big deal. And I wrote this piece thinking, oh, people will will hate this piece. I'm being snobby. I'm being nostalgic. I'm mythologizing. You know, experience. The world's moved on. We all have apps. We're all streaming. 
And I was amazed at the reaction. I mean, it basically, it sort of went viral. It really traveled. Uh, it, it, I, I know for a fact, according to my editor, that it, it dominated the, the traffic for, for the Walrus for, for a while. And, uh, you know, an editor, a food editor at the New York Times linked to it, The Athletic linked to it. And then my publisher wrote to me out of the blue and said, you know, we have this series, this series of, of, of books uh, called Field Notes. Um, so I published the Biblioasis and they, they conceived of this field note series to uh, essentially to sort of function the way like, like, like 18th century pamphlet function, like, you know, 25,000 word polemical books on a topic like property or the pandemic pandemic or whatever. And, and so they have, you know, there's one called on pandemics, there's one called on, on property and so on. And he, my publisher, Jan Wells, said, why don't you do, would you be interested in doing on browsing? So, you know, so I, I the rest is history, but I, you know, I, I really, when I started, when I set out, I thought I was exploring a very personal niche kind of feeling. And, and I was amazed at, at, at how much it seemed to resonate uh, with people online. That's a fascinating story, but now I'm going to play the journalist and point out that you didn't answer the actual question, which is why, (laughs) why did something about spending time aimlessly at a mall, looking through CDs or wandering around resonate uh, so far and why? Like, clearly you hit a nerve. What is that nerve, though, that we're trying to talk about? I mean, I, I can, I can speak for myself in that I was feeling worn out. You know, we were ordering our groceries. You know, we had we had really small kids. Yeah. And we didn't we didn't feel super comfortable um, taking them out to stores. And we were, you know, we're privileged in the sense that we could, you could we could order things to our house. And I, um, y- you know, so so we were doing a lot of, of online ordering all the time. I think we were feeling exhausted. I think we were missing the experience of 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 sort of of being bodies in space, moving through stores, discovering things by accident that we hadn't set out to look for. You know, the, so much of the experience I of of online shopping I find alienating. You know, like products appear to you as these these tiles on the screen, and you you click on them, and they may or may not be in stock. And so just that that communal experience of going out to a store, sharing a set of like options with everyone who's in that store. And they're all there. They're on the shelf. You don't have to click on them. You can pick their in stock. If, you know, you can pick them up. So uh, I, maybe it was something to do with that, something to do with, with missing um, that sense of community you get from, from being out and about. What is different about browsing? I mean, you mentioned that shopping online is different because you're looking for something that may or may not be in stock. But I do a lot of like online shopping browsing on my phone, right? Where I will just search for random things. What's different between that and the kind of browsing we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. I think that browsing, I mean, I hate online shopping. I hate being, I mean, I do it. I, I, I certainly, we're not, you know, my, we're not Luddites. But you don't enjoy it. Why not? I find scroll, first of all, I find scrolling my phone a very blinkered, linear experience, right? You, you know, you, you sort of call up a website, you scroll through the, 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 various, the various pictures of the clothing or the um, CD or the, or the um, I say CD, haha. <laughs> People don't buy CDs, but you know what I mean? Like, you, you're, you know, you're scrolling through the, the product. It's very linear. It's very blinkered. You click on, on something and you're sort of like immediately hustled to the product page, right? Whereas, you know, when I used to go into the world's biggest bookstore, which was a great big bookstore in, in downtown Toronto, you, you know, you had a kind of panoramic view of this, of this big space. You know, if you wanted to get to buy a, a whatever, like a William Gibson novel, you sort of had to make your way to the science fiction section. You had to make your way to the part of the section um, for the books whose author's last name ended in start with G. You know, you and and on route you were like being exposed to like other possibilities. You might stumble on something you you hadn't seen. And again, you know, I've had this experience of 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 online shopping where. Uh, 
you know, you click on something that might not be in stock or, or you order it and then you get the email like a week later, there's a delay, there's a problem. The lovely thing about browsing was, you know, if the book was there, it was there, you picked it up. If it wasn't there, you might stumble on something else that you weren't necessarily looking for. And I find that the, the, the algorithms, the like recommendation engines, they never suggest something to me that I'm actually interested in, in, in purchasing. They are crunching numbers. They're looking at, you know, what other customers purchased who were interested in that item, you're not going to find, you're not necessarily going to get some quirky oddball suggestion. But that, that whole, that the serendipity is, is really what you, st- you lose when you're, when you're shopping online, the, the sort of chance encounter. You know, some of, the, some of the things that have meant the most to me are things that I, wasn't, I hadn't set out to look for you know, like a particular album or a particular, um, or a particular book discovered in a used, a used music store, used bookstore. I was not looking for that particular item. It was not something I was going to find in a, in a more mainstream store or, or necessarily online. It was, it was purely by chance that I stumbled on it. And some of those albums and books were, were almost life-changing in a sense. And they were, they were, they were, purely found through through accident. That's a great explanation. And when we did an episode earlier this year, I'm going to talk now about maybe why uh, browsing r- resonated with me, but we did an episode earlier this year about our dying attention spans in general. And it's just incredibly hard to focus and pay attention. And one of the things that came up in that discussion is that it's very, very difficult for us to be aimless anymore. And I know browsing isn't exactly aimless because theoretically you're going there with like, I might want to buy this CD or this book or whatever. But is it the same general principle that you kind of have to satisfy yourself with whatever happens to be in front of you? And, you know, you're not looking through um, a Netflix queue, which is the best example I can have, just paralyzed by like there's 15,000 movies in here. I got to choose the best one. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think there's something about the activity of browsing that is that there's a semi aimlessness to it, right? Because you you can set out for uh for the city, for the bookstore with an idea. But you know the way we used to do it, like my buddies and I when we when we were in high school in the 1990s, like none of us had a smartphone, right? My parents in particular were not helicopter parents. They were an older generation. We were, you know, it was benign neglect was kind of the, the operative principle. And we, you know, we, my buddies, we'd set out for the city on our own. If we split up, we had to arrange to meet somewhere. We were very much alone. And, you know, there was certainly that we had some, we were, you know, maybe joking around with each other. But when we were like, when we went into like HMV or whatever, you know, we were sort of all on our private mission. We weren't, we didn't have tweets or emails coming in. We weren't checking our phone. So browsing was, uh, was uh, closer to something like aimlessness. You know, in the book, there's, there's, a, really, um, there's a really useful uh, definition of browsing that um, the editor and critic, Leon Wieseltier, um, came up with. He, he wrote about the loss of a, of a beloved record store in the New Republic like a decade ago. And, um, and he sort of used that occasion to, to kind of meditate a little bit on, on the difference between like browsing and, and search, you know, that was his distinction. I think of it as kind of like browsing, scrolling, but, you know, he was sort of talking about, you know, the, the difference between browsing a store versus searching on Amazon. And, you know, he says, you know, browsing is the opposite of search. Search is precise. Browsing is imprecise. When you search, you find what you were looking for. When you browse, you find what you were not looking for. Search corrects your knowledge. Browsing corrects your ignorance. And so he very much, he, you know, he, for him, browsing was this kind of like time on, he called it like a, he calls it like a time honored intellectual and cultural activity. It is, it is a kind of aimlessness and, but it, it, it widens, it doesn't narrow. Whereas when you're, you know, if you're if you're on Amazon and you're looking for a particular book, you type that 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 title in, and it, you, you you're zoomed right to that page, and 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 you miss that opportunity to wander. You miss that opportunity for your eyes to fall on something else on on an adjacent shelf. 
so yeah, that I mean that really resonates with me that I, that idea of browsing as, as a form of of, of 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 aimless discovery. You mentioned that it is a time honored tradition. Is it still a time honored tradition? I have a five year old kid. You mentioned that you have a couple of young kids. Have you tried to get them to browse or take them to a store and say, you know, go find something? It's very interesting because my kids are six and three. They were obviously a couple years younger when the pandemic started, and we just didn't bring them to a lot of stores, right? When we finally started relenting, and we and most of us were vaxxed. My daughter only just, you know, she only just got back because she was um, the, the last cohort, right? When we finally relented and took them to stores, like they were blown away. Like we took them to Loblaws. And it was like, it was like going to, it was like better than going to the ROM or something. <laughs> it was like, it was so exciting. They each got to like pick a tree, run it, you know, like just the, the stimulation of running down aisles. So now, you know, their sensory, the sensory stimulation has been, has been somewhat impoverished in some ways by the pandemic. So that will possibly shift. But, you know, we, we had this interesting experience earlier in the summer because it was my, it was my son's birthday and we were, I think we were in Ottawa, we were visiting his grandparents and he really wanted to watch, I think the new Minions movie was out and he really wanted to rewatch Despicable Me. And at that time it had just left Netflix. We thought it was there and it had like, it had, it had left and it wasn't there. Right. And, you know, my, my kids are growing up with streaming and the internet and, and and for them, sort of, you know, like so-called content, it's just, it's just, it's plentiful. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, you pull it out of the air. And it was almost like, it almost sort of took, took him up short a little bit. Like, oh, this thing that was accessible is no longer accessible. On our way home, we stopped in Belleville. We always stop in Belleville because there's a lovely, there's a lovely mall that has incredibly, not one, but two music stores. It has a sun, and these have really vanished, right, from from malls, right? I mean, you, you know, there's certainly independents down, downtown, although those have dwindled. But it, we stopped at Belleville, and they have a sunrise, and they have a Sam the Record Man. They have the last Sam the Record Man. Yeah. Well, someone bought the, the rights to it, and you can buy a T-shirt at this at this store that says, yes, this is the last Sam the Record Man, and I have, I have, have that T-shirt. So we stopped at the mall, and we found Despicable Me on DVD for four bucks. And we uh, and we have a we have a little portable DVD player, we, and so on the rest on the rest of the way home, they watch Despicable Me in the back seat, and so they're starting to get, or at least my son is starting to get the idea that actually streaming is 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 not necessarily the solution to everything. That you still kind of need stuff, right? Like he's starting to get that. Oh, like it's in. It's important to have the the DVD because some of the movies are not on Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever. That's funny, and I will ask you my my final question. But just to to share a story on the flip side of that, uh, when we started taking my daughter to toy stores after the pandemic, she could not understand why the toy store in our neighborhood did not have the exact specific copy of the one book that she wanted because she's so used to me being able to go on. Amazon or somewhere else and get exactly the book that she wants that she didn't understand that like a store just didn't have everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that is, that is an interesting, that is, that is an interesting (laughs) point. You know, like I, my kids are going to have a very different childhood in the sense that I, I experienced real limits as a kid, like especially a young kid, like you couldn't go, you know, if you wanted something, you had to go to the store, you couldn't go on Sunday you had to make do with what was there. If what was if what was there wasn't there, you had to fit. You had to figure it out, right? And they're having a little bit of that experience too with like Saturday morning cartoons. Like they they have really like CBC Kids, right? And so they come downstairs and they we put it on. But you know they get annoyed when there's a show on that they don't like, and it's like we have to explain to them. No, it's like live TV. Like we can't like fast forward through this. Like you just you can't choose. You have to sort of endure it. But they're they're sort of okay, right? Like they make do. You can't choose, yeah. Yeah, yeah they get over it. But uh, but but they're not used to they're not used to having to accept, uh, not used to not having a choice in what they want to consume. Exactly, and I I think what I 
you know, and what what's interesting is I experienced the limitless, the, the seemingly limit, let's say seemingly limitless choice, because I think there are limits to the internet in some respects. Um, and I've had my frustrations with finding things. But, you know, the se- that seemingly limitless choice actually find, starts to be oppressive in a way. And, you know, I, you used, I think earlier you used the word paralyzed. Like I've had that experience of like, you know, sort of plop down in front of something like Netflix and feeling um, paralyzed with indecision and, and then just, you know, watching whatever, you know, stupid thing is trending at the moment. Um, so I think that, uh, I think there, there was a real value to, to, to having some limits and, and to having a kind of a uh, circumscribed set of, 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 of choices. And, uh, and, uh, and we survived. <laughs> Last question. If somebody's been listening to this conversation and is kind of like intrigued by it, they're probably like, why am I getting this conversation on a news podcast? But it's okay. That's why we do these on the weekend. Um, the question I have is, how would you recommend somebody who maybe has lost that feeling or doesn't quite remember it, try to experience browsing today, tomorrow, and, and see if it moves them? Well, I think you'd have to leave your phone at home and set out for the, uh, a nice walkable neighborhood, in, in, you know, that has, uh, that still has some bookstores and, 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 you know, like an area that's got that sort of high density and pedestrian friendly and leave your phone, which I think is like an unthinkable, an unthinkable notion, but, you know, being truly by arranged to be truly by yourself for a while. And, and that's a tall order, but I, I think the, uh, you know, what I really missed when I was younger was that ability of being truly by myself and just wandering and being open to, to discovery and, and, nev- and more often than not, finding something that I, I hadn't set out for and it, and it sort of taking the top of my head off, to, to quote Emily Dickinson. Jason, thank you so much for this. It's a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Jason Gurriel, author of On Browsing. That was The Big Story. You can find more at thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you scroll down or click on the episodes page, you can browse for an episode you might have missed. You can also find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can also email us, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. And of course, call us, 416-935-5935. Leave us a voicemail. We're always happy to hear from you. You can get The Big Story in every single podcast player. And you can ask for it on your smart speaker by saying, play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. Take some time to walk around aimlessly. And we'll talk Monday.